Uh huh. All right, everyone. Good afternoon. Apologies to be a bit slow getting started, but I just want to introduce today's speaker for this joint uh, seminar between EEP and the Center for the Study of Complex Systems. Uh, and uh, the, the speaker today is, uh, is Fernanda Malotinos, who uh, comes to us from the University of Arizona in Tucson. Sorry, I got to get my notes. Apologies. Uh, well, I'll have to remember. She comes to us from the University of Arizona in Tucson, where she's uh, been for the last couple of years doing a postdoctoral research fellowship there with Neil Martinez. Uh, before that, she was at the Pacific Ecoinformatics and what is it? What is the C stand for? Computational <laughs> Ecology. Ecology, yeah. Yeah, a laboratory in California, and she did her PhD uh, in the University of, uh, of Santiago, uh, the University of Chile in Santiago. So I won't uh, go on uh, much more. Uh, just to introduce the title, elucidating ecological complexity. So thank you, please. For now. Thank you very much. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I a real honor for me to be here and to share with you my research on complex ecological systems. Uh, my research aims to better understand and predict the structure and dynamics of complex ecosystems, including their responses to human impacts. I slightly modified the title. I, I used to have multi-layer networks here. But I prefer now to use mechanistic approaches to networks because it better reflects what I, it, it better uh, explains what I'm going to present today without just much jargon. Ecological networks have been key to address one of the most fundamental questions in ecology. It was famously stated by Bob May as what makes for stability in enduring natural systems. There is no government here. There is no DNA regulating ecosystems in the way that it regulates uh, individual organisms. But still, several species, many species, along with their interactions, persist. How does nature do it? This is one of the key questions that inspired my research. Among the many definitions uh, for stability in ecology, I use uh, the ability of numerous species and interactions to persist within ecological systems. More specifically, I, use, I measure stability as species persistence, which is the fraction of initial species that persist until the end of the simulations, which is also a is inverse to extinction risk. This question is especially relevant today, given all the biodiversity loss and other human impacts on ecological systems. But this question has had a long history. It started over a half century ago with the uh, complexity stability debate about whether uh, additional, additional complexity in terms of species richness and number of interactions destabilizes or stabilizes the networks or e ecosystems in that time. Uh, uh, evidence invoked in that time uh, in included Lotka Volterra models and linear stability analysis. This uh, debate later shifted to a debate about biodiversity and ecosystem function that pretty much hinged on experiments mm, uh, on the effect of number of species, plant species, on ecosystem function, such as uh, net primary productivity. More recent research in this area have incorporated nonlinearities in the form of maximum consumption thresholds, the mechanistic basis of positive and negative net effects among species, and the non-random architecture of species interaction networks. These are the advances, the uh, scientific advances that I incorporate in my theory of ecological stability and function. These advances have been uh, previously incorporated in the food webs research, which 
aims to understand how network architecture affects ecological dynamics. In a, in a food web, each node represents a species and the links connecting the nodes represent traffic interactions, that is, who it's whom. Uh, research on food webs has incorporated a key concept. So th uh, this research has led the incorporation of cutting edge tools from the science of complex networks, and it has also inspired some research in, in more general complex network theory. Another type of ecological networks comprises mutualistic interactions. In this uh, figure here, on the left, we have the, each node represents a plant species, and on the right, each node represents a pollinator species. The links connecting the, the nodes represent mutualistic interactions. Traditionally, uh, the, the study on food webs and mutualistic networks have been analyzed separately. But we know that, that the communities are comprised by both trophic and mutualistic interactions. My research incorporates these two types of interactions by developing a mechanistic approach to the analysis of the structure and dynamics of complex plant pollinator networks. And I do this by addressing three main frontiers in ecological networks, which are, uh, I'm going to use these frontiers, frontiers uh, to outline my talk. First, my approach scales up behavior of organisms and populations to larger scaled communities and ecosystems that contain these organisms. Second, uh, my approach, or I develop a more mechanistic approach that integrates reproductive and trophic interactions within ecological networks. Reproductive in terms of reproductive services, mutualistic interactions. And finally, uh, my, pr my, uh, my theory, uh, from my theory emerge some predictions that I test with empirical data. So my, my story starts with this project that I conducted back in Chile, in which I uh, helped to build this empirical network of 77 plant species. Here, each node is a species. Uh, and we, uh, there are 110, 110 visitors, vi uh, flower visitors that are these pollinators. I call it visitation and not pollination because a visit does not mean, not always means a pollination event. Uh, so this network had 362 visitation interactions. Back in, this is a network in Sabandes, Chile. My question was, what is the effect of removing the alien plants from that network? Here in yellow, I'm highlighting all the alien plants among the 77 plant species. The alien is uh, known by the, by the experts. So, uh, so I know which are the plants there, and the, they're not the native plants there. So we know who are the aliens by the name. Uh, so the, the, um, to, to, to evaluate the, the, the effect of removing the alien plant species, I uh, consider all the population models that were community dynamic models that were available at that time. Uh, and the ones that were available were these Lotka Volterra type models in which the positive interaction are modeled here by this alpha. Each, each plant had a, a dynamic equation, each animal a dynamic equation. Other models available are where, where the Lotka Volterra saturated a functional response here for the positive interaction. Uh, but 
that, those models assumed that animals always benefit plants and plants always benefit animals, either in a saturated or not saturated way. And that means that, that animals, they assume that animals always carry that pollen uh, and plants always have floral rewards available for the animals, which is, we know from the field that it's not true. And, but they were, those were the models available at that time. I was not going to generate a new model. Uh, so I chose this model that had the same problems, but at least uh, it, ha it allowed me to incorporate the topology of the network, that is, who visits whom. So I used this model in my research. I ran the simulations using that meta-community population model a dynamic model, and I found here, uh, my results are here, in the x-axis, I have my simulations in which I did not remove any species. Then the aliens were removed, or, and also random removals to, to as null models. In the y-axis, I have the fraction of native species that were lost at the end of the simulations. And what I found that here, that removing alien plants w was actually better than not removing, removing them. So actually the opposite, that alien plants helped the network in terms of uh, native species. So re removing alien plants reduces native species richness. So this is a very counterintuitive result, right? Is alien plants supposedly are bad for the system. So I start <coughs> discussing this result with empiricists and the, the question was, well, but this is a model that does not incorporate the behavioral responses of the pollinators. So we remove the plants, I remove the plants, but I did not allow the pollinators to respond to that change in resources. So that is something that the, the behavior of pollinators is something that has been studying, has been studied for a long time by empiricists who have seen in the field that regarding which are the plants available, pollinators prefer uh, different plants regarding the, res the floral rewards availability. So that's when my current research started in which I asked what is the effect on species persistence of the behavioral responses of pollinators to changes in resource availability. So I, com I, I want to ask that, and I asked it. So to, to be able to ask that question, I went back to the literature uh, and I review and synthesize all the work on uh, the consequences of adaptive foraging, I will say here, adaptive foraging for the structure and dynamics of food webs. And here I define adaptive foraging again as the behavioral responses to changes in resource availability. I am assuming, as many others, that these re behavioral responses increases fitness, but a more thoroughly or rigorous way to, to test it will be doing more um, uh, invasions with mutants, but it's something that I'm collaborating with, collaborating with other people in my department, but it's not one, what I'm going to show today. So I, I review all the literature on that, and, uh, and here I'm not going to go through the whole table, but it's just to show you that the, the value of this work was synthesizing sophisticated modeling, actually from many, from all, all that modeling, oh, most of it was in physical journals. So I synthesized it and unif uh, into a unified conceptual framework to make it more understandable for biologists. And I will go only through the, uh, ex to explain the replicator-based equation or framework, which is a behavior that converges also to the other two that are game theory and solitary optimal foraging. And the replicator-based approach to adaptive foraging tries to solve 
a particular question or problem in which is uh, which are the foraging efforts that the consumer is going to assign to each of its prey, separate uh, resources. And it, the way to mathematize it is the foraging effort that the consumer J is going to assign to the resource I is going to increase if it increases the per capita growth rate of the consumer with a constraint that is the allocation cost. If the lion here increases its effort on zero, it's going to decrease the effort on, on, on bustle. It is a, this is a constraint optimization problem that can be solved using Lagrange multipliers that I'm not going to explain it today, but the solution of that problem is the replicated equation which says that the effort, foraging effort of consumer J for resource I is going to increase if the benefit from foraging on I is higher than the benefit from foraging on an average prey. It's going to increase by that. Or decrease if this is lower than the average. So the results of this research was that Adaptive foraging in food webs promotes the complex structure of food webs, also increases the stability in many different ways to define stability. In many studies, increase the resilience, increase the, the persistence, local stability. Uh, also reverses the main negative complexity stability relationship, which means that in, in networks with adaptive forager, more complex networks were more stable and provides resilience and resistance against perturbations. But previous models of uh, dynamic models of mutualistic networks, the population dynamics, have not incorporated adaptive foraging. So that was my mission. So I, after developing that review and synthesis, I started I developed a consumer resource approach to pollination networks. And after reading about the biology and also my conversations with empiricists, I decided that I was going to incorporate three main processes. First, of course, adaptive foraging. Second, the dynamic production and depletion of floral rewards. And finally, the dilution of conspecific pollen by heterospecific pollen. And I used that approach to ask what is the effect of nested architecture, I will explain in two slides, uh, of mutualistic networks on their species persistence. So that question actually generated a very in active debate in the literature of mutualistic networks. Some people, some groups say that nestedness stabilizes the networks. Some others say it destabilizes. So who is right? And what is nestedness? In a nested network, here I'm, I'm representing a toy system with four plant species and four pollinator species. The rows here are sorted by number of links, number of interactions. These are the most generalized plant, the least generalized plant, same for pollinators. And in a nested network, the interactions of the most specialist plant is a subset of the interaction of the of all virtually all the more generalized plants. That is true for both plants and pollinators. Right? Just to show you to illustrate a non-nested network, this is a non-nested network. Importantly, about 80% of the observed networks in, in nature are nested. So that's why it's important to know if they stabilize or not. And now another way to represent nestedness is using this graph, in, in which again, the interaction of the most specialist plant, which is this bumblebee there, 
is a subset of the interaction of the most generalized plants, which are also visited by the bumblebee. What happened here? All these plants are sharing the pollination services of this pollinator, which means that there is a high niche overlap among the plants for the pollination services of that pollinator. Which brings the question of why we don't see more competitive exclusion in these systems. And also, what, have, what about the interspecific pollen transfer? Like, this pollinator carries the pollen of all these plants, not just one. Now, in the, in the, on the side of the pollinators, the, the, the interaction of this general, specialist pollinator is this generalist plant, which are also visited by the other pollinators. Which means that all these pollinators exhibit a high niche overlap in terms of the floral rewards of this plant. Again, why we don't see more competitive exclusion. And just to remind you, all these, uh, the analysis, previous analysis on this, on the effect of nestedness on the stability of the networks, have been only considered positive, positive effect using a lot of stereotype models. What I do is I disarticulate this um, with, with this positive effect into the mechanism behind those, which is trophic interactions, that is, the pollinator consume the rewards produced by the plant and, sorry, and reproductive services that the pollinator provides to the plant. To do that, I split up the dynamics of the plant in the vegetative dynamics, so it's, and the floral rewards dynamics. In that case, the pollinator consumes the rewards and provides the pollination service to the plant. Trophic interaction, reproductive services. The model, so the first layer is the trophic interactions. This is the equation for the population dynamics of the animals. The, the abundance of the animal J is going to increase over time with the consumption of floral rewards and decrease with the mortality. In terms of the consumption of floral rewards, this is the floral reward abundance, which is going to increase in time by the production of floral rewards by the plant in a saturated way. And it's going to decrease by the consumption of the floral rewards by the animals. So these two, are, these two equations are coupled by the visit that the animal exerts on the plant, animal J, plant I. This quantity of visit is going to increase by the foraging preference, which I'm going to explain right now. So the quantity of visit of any animal J for plant on plant I is going to increase with the foraging preference, which is the replicator equation. So this preference is going to increase if the food intake from plant species I is higher than the food intake from an average plant. That is an adaptive foraging. And now, the second layer, the reproductive services. So this is the population dynamics for the, of the plant species I, which is going to increase. So the, the, the abundance of plant species I is going to increase over time with the growth and decrease with the mortality. The growth is a function of the quantity of visits that I, I just explained, the quality of the visit, and the seed recruitment. So if we go a little bit before <coughs> here, so uh, only a fraction of the visits that the pollinator J assigns to plant I is going to convert to pollination event. And this quality of visit depends on how many other plants the, the pollinator visit. 
So it's a fraction of the visit that the animal assigns to I and also exerts to the other plants in, the, in its diet. Then uh, only a fraction of those pollination, e pollination events are going to be converted to seeds and only a fraction of those seeds are going to be recruit to adult. That seed recruitment uh, represents the competition for other resources among plants. And here is the intra-specific competition coefficient and the inter-competition coefficient. So that is the model. The question again is how does nestedness affect the species persistence of pollination networks? And also, does adaptive foraging matter? I run in silico experiments, that is, simulations. First, I generate thousands of networks of varying nestedness and network complexity. And as network complexity, I'm talking about number of species and number of interactions, connectants, for the ones that know networks. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about those results. They're cool results. If you want to know more, ask me in, during the questions. Uh, I then run the dynamics without and with adaptive foraging. Without adaptive foraging means that the pollinators evenly prefer each of its plants, which means if the pollinator visits three plants, it's going to prefer one third of the time each plant. And adap with adaptive foraging means that uh, the, its links have this re replicated equation. So the pollinator is going to prefer the plants with more rewards. Okay. And then uh, at the end of this, 3,000 time steps, I run the, uh, I analyze the species persistence, abundance, uh, reward abundance, foraging preferences, and pollination event. Just to give you, uh, like, I'm not only a, a theoretical ecologist, I'm also a computational ecologist, which, and to show that, <laughs> I, so this system, varying network complexity, means that I have 40 to 200 species, networks, so each network, each simulation had 40 or 200 species. The simulations ranged from 90 to 450 pollination interactions, which means, given the model that I showed to you, that my simulation had from a range from 140 to 700 differential equations a lot of simulations, and a lot of computational power. Uh, I, I coded it in, in MATLAB and I ran the simulations first in my computer, it was a good code, and also uh, then in a Linux cluster. The results, in the x-axis here, I have nestedness with a very well-known index for nestedness. Uh, the, in the y-axis, I have the niche overlap without adaptive foraging. Where niche over, to measure niche overlap, I use this horn si similarity index that some people could be familiar with because it's a way to, to measure uh, di differences in diversity among um, plots or communities. And in the case of, of uh, uh, my, this preferences, what I did is I have this matrix, matrix, and I compare quantitatively how similar the, foraging, the distribution of foraging efforts uh, for any preferences between uh, among uh, of each pollinator for each plant among pollinators, right? So what I found is that nestedness increases the niche overlap uh, of among pollinators. Here the different colors mean different levels of connectance. Uh, I will not explain that. And then uh, when I included adaptive foraging to the networks, I found the opposite. Nestedness decreases the niche overlap among pollinators. So what is the effect of adaptive foraging here? It reverses, adaptive foraging reverses the effect of nestedness on niche overlap. What is, where are the effects of uh, adaptive foraging and nestedness 
on persistence now. In the y-axis, I have the effect of nestedness, I should be nested there, on the average persistence of all the species in the network. So without adaptive foraging, nestedness decreases, this is the average of the simulations, decreases the uh, effect of, so no, without adaptive foraging, nestedness decreases in 20% the species persistence of all the species in the network. With adaptive foraging, nestedness increases the species persistence of all the species in the network. So again, uh, adaptive foraging reverses the effect of nestedness now on persistence. So th this might be a resolution of the debate because nestedness, I found that nestedness destabilizes and stabilizes the networks depending on if the networks have adaptive foragers or not. Uh, just to explain a, lead, a bit long, a bit more the results, I split the uh, effect on the species persistence of animals and plants. And now adaptive foraging eliminates the negative effect of nestedness on the persistence of animals and reverses the uh, effect of nestedness on species persistence of plants from negative to positive which tells you that something is going on with the pollination events when nestedness uh, is there. I will explain that now. So this result m might suggest that adaptive foraging may explain why nestedness in, in nature, so why, why nested networks in nature can persist. So what explains this result? Without adaptive foraging, the as I said, pollinators evenly prefer each of their plants. So in this case, this has, pollinator has three plants, one third of the time prefer each of the plants. <coughs> this pollinator half, and the specialist pollinator can only visit the only plant that it pollinates. What is the distribution of the rewards given this distribution of preferences? The Specialist plant now, so oh, let's start here. The journalist plant receives many visits, so its rewards are very low in comparison to the other plant. And the specialist plant, because it gets very few visits, has very high level of rewards available for the pollinators. Which means that the pollinator, the specialist pollinator here, gets very few rewards or resources to persist and it goes extinct. It goes extinct. Then the plant, the specialist plant, receives very few visits and those visits are not very, uh, are, are low quality visits and it goes extinct. Low quality because they are, they have all these other pollen also. So it's not just con specific pollen. Now with adaptive foraging, the situation is the next. The, now the, the pollinators are able to respond to the rewards, so which means that now this journalist pollinator prefer the journalist plant because there are more rewards there. Also, so that means that it repletes the, goes down that resource, <coughs> but by specializing on that plant, now it releases <coughs> the floor rewards of the journalist plant, which now, by, by releasing those rewards, the specialist pollinator can get enough resources to persist. Also, the specialist plant gets enough, enough visits that are high quality, more visits that are more uh, high quality visits, so it also persists. <coughs> this is also, so what happens here is that adaptive foraging produces niche partitioning in, in, this, in the system. And to see it, you just follow the thick lines and you see that the generalist pollinator 
specialized on the specialist plant, the middle term pollinator on the middle term plant. And as always, this pollinator has been specialized on the plant. So there is niche partitioning, which, uh, which, which explains the coexistence of all the plants and, and, and pollinators. So that was my theory. So I had these this results, and I wanted to test my results with empirical data. What is the prediction that uh, I, I tested was pollinators prefer specialist plants. In the case, adaptive pollinators prefer specialist plants. And here, I have the plant generality, which means the number of pollinators that a plant has. So for example, here, two means that that plant that I'm going to plot later, this plant has two pollinators, two eight. And in the y-axis, I have the normalized foraging effort, which means visits normalized by abundances of plants and pollinators. Here is the model result. I found, again, that this negative trend means that uh, pollinators prefer specialist plant, generalist pollinators, and avoid generalist plants. The data that I used to test my model was collected in Colorado, the Rocky Mountain Biological Lab. It's a beautiful picture there. And the, my, my co-authors chased the, the, the bees, the bumblebees. There were uh, more than 1,000 bumblebees, individuals, from eight different species. Uh, more than 30,000 visits were collected. And what, I, what we found is that the same train, which means that these bumblebees that are well known to be adaptive foragers prefer the specialist plant when we normalize by abundance. So as a summary of my research, what I have presented. So um, I, uh, my research integrates different types of interactions among species, trophic and reproductive services. I have shown that how behavior of the organisms and populations uh, affect the behavior of uh, communities, in this case, in terms of persistence. So adaptive foraging affects the persistence of the, of, the, of the network. And then I tested predictions with empirical data, one prediction. Looking forward. I, I hope that I, I convinced you ab about, like, I illustrated the power of mechanistic approaches to, mul to these multi-layered ecological networks. By multi-layered, I mean different type of interactions. Extending the approach, now I will show my, my research on how extending this approach to food webs and uh, some applications to ecosystem management and a little bit of evolution. So all what I have presented to you until now is about plant pollinator systems. But plants are eaten by herbivores and pollinators are eaten by other carnivores. So they are part of a larger system, which is the food web. I'm right now conducti conducting research uh, adding pollination to food webs. Uh, I do, I'm doing that by guiding a wonderful PhD student at my department. Uh, in, uh, we're generating the food webs using a well-known model that is called niche model. And among those uh, in, in each network, we are randomly choosing the herbivores that are going to be actually pollinators, and also randomly choosing plants that are going to be wind pollinated or animal pollinated, um, which allows us to incorporate into the food web these reproductive services that pollinators provide to the plant. That is one of my now uh, current research. The second area that I'm extending my research to are fisheries. 
and it's clear to me at least the 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 application that food webs have to give to fisheries in terms that a uh, fish that we 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 explode are part of a larger community so we conducted this research with Anna Kuparinen in a we found that the life history changes produced by fisheries, which means uh, changes in a uh, body side of the target population and also uh, earlier maturation, destabilizes the ecosystem even after the, fish the fisheries stopped. Uh, just to show you a little bit what we did, we had this a well parameterized model of the lake constant, uh, which is here in, the, in Germany, Switzerland, and Austria. And we have algae, bacteria, different rotifers, and the white fish, we split the node in five different life stages. Uh, so this is like the way that larvae go to, to juvenile, then to one year old, fish, two years old, and two, three years old, and plus. And the, also for the perch, and what we did is like, the, the fisheries were uh, exploding, extracting biomass from the adult, three years old adult. So that is what we already published at the beginning of this year. My, my research ex is expanding to incorporating economic interactions which would be great to, to talk more, especially with people in complex systems, like how to incorporate economics here. Uh, just a first shot, um, I'm using this equation, which uh, describes the, uh, f how the fishing effort change over time, which depends on the price, so the income, on the income and the cost per unit effort, the income per unit effort and the cost. And the income depends on the price. So now, how much human ex extract from the system does not only depend on the abundance of the fish, but also depends on the price in the market of that fish. And there is a bunch of good theory depending, uh, describing the dynamics of prices. That is another. And finally, I'm also working on evolution of food webs with people in, in France. It, Corinne Alhoff is part of the Nicolas Lille. Lay. Uh, lab <laughs> French names. Uh, and so what we are doing is that we are starting with uh, one species food web, so food web, one species or, or little food webs in which we are incorporating invaders, like new species arrive to the system, and also speciation. So from the from the particular species, we uh, randomly assign new values and uh, add a new node from that is a speciation event. So we build this network which fortunately gets the realistic structures, but then they're extinction avalanches and again, grows again. And we are collaborating also with Hélène Morlon in Ecole Normale Superior to uh, track the phylogeny, because we know which is the parent species and the daughter species, so we can construct a phylogeny. So we want to compare how well or if, if there is any similarity between the phylogenies generated by our model and the real phylogenies. And as conclusions, in conclusion, I hope that I, 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 convinced, to you, I convinced you that more mechanistic ap network approaches to complex networks, or more mechanistic approaches to complex networks, can develop powerful theory about the structure and dynamics of ecological systems. And to do so, uh, I, I strongly think that we need to be informed by field observations and then also test our theory with, with the field observations. I also have shown how, that how we can apply uh, this approach to important areas such as ecosystem services like pollination management, like fisheries, and evolution. And finally, I look forward to keep developing theory at the intersection of ecology and network science. Thank you very much.
for questions. I, I'll just let you for another few of your own questions if you're already back. Sorry? You, ah. you can recognize anyone in the room. <laughs> well, thanks for your talk. It was mm -hmm. Yeah, so first of all, there, there are ways to restrict the parameter values. So that, and, and because the parameters are very um, biologically inspired, <coughs> so it's very easy to, to at least restrict them in a, in a space that I can start drawing the, uh, randomly the parameters. And actually it was not hard at all to start running the simulations. It's, like it was not that my system was crashing right away. So just by uh, restricting the parameters to what is biologically likely, uh, I started running them. Uh, in a, in a, in, like the abundances were not negative. Uh, I had like this persistence. Uh, and then, so that is like the start, right? And then... Um, to figure out what's biologically likely, what it, what it Yeah, for example, uh, I have there like the a quality of visits. So many of those are restricted in between zero and one. So it's, that is a huge restriction, right? So many of them are in between zero and one. And then when you take that choice, you, the other ones, the other parameters are related to that one. So with that relation, it was easier also to, to start uh, assigning the parameters to the other ones that are not in between zero and one. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, uh, uh, sensitivity analysis. But I'm really looking forward, like, in a space like this one, like, there are so many good th theoreticians to really tackle this big co problem that we have in ecology, that is, uh, we have all these parameters, and, and, but systems in ecology are complex, so we can, instead of avoiding the problem, that is, I oh, know we will go to just locable Terra models because it's very tractable, no, I prefer to, like, look for methods, better sensitivity analysis, better ways to constrain the parameters with the data and also theoretically, so we can, we can move forward. Can I ask you a question? So if I understood it correctly, the simulation in the, in the middle part of your talk, uh, looking at the pollinator uh, networks with food resources included, you, if I, correct me if I understand it incorrectly, but you, you have, uh, you, you, you account for the movement of energy and, and pollen through the system, mm -hmm. and you, uh, you use the replicator equations to allow the, strat the four gene strategies of the pollinators to change. Yes. Uh, so, and then you compare equal foraging mm -hmm. with an adaptive foraging scenario. So, and then you demonstrate, you see some pronounced differences between those two. So, is that, is that more or less right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, did you, I'm wondering to what extent is the, the big difference that you see due to the dynamic nature of the behavioral strategies, the fact that they can adapt to changing conditions versus the adaptive st uh, feature, right? So in other words, if we allow them, for example, you could mm. allow the, uh, the pollinators to choose the optimal constant strategy. And then mm. I wonder what would, but, but you know, it wouldn't be dynamic. Would you see the same effect, or so, so? Can you speculate as to how much it's the dynamics and how much it's the adaptive? Wow, that's a great question. Um, well, right now, after knowing the results, probably even if it's not dynamic, might get to the same results. Yeah, but after knowing the results, so it's like a would be more like that is a, a great way to simplify the system actually. I, I would love to test it. But my first intuition is that probably just a static optimal strategy would, would get it. In this system, probably if, if I perturb, because here I don't have perturbations, external perturbations. Like in, in for example, if I extinct, remove species or invade with the species, maybe it's different. But right, just now that I, I don't have perturbations, probably I'll get the same result. Yeah. Mm. So, so just to follow up on that, so you see very different effects, or much, much more pronounced effects in the plants than in the animals. Yeah. Can you explain why? Yeah, because of the, um, so the, the, the added effect of 
the pollination part because it's not just the quantity of visit that matter for the plants, also the quality. So nest and nest without adaptive foraging decreases the quantity and the quality, which both get increased by adaptive foraging. Mm -hmm. good or bad, and then uh, you say the adaptive foraging helped to resolve that. It could be good or bad, mm -hmm. on things. but then it, for, for the, the systems, the specific systems that gave rise to the controversy, did the, uh, I mean, could, could you actually point to it and say this is the specific reason why your system was better and yours was worse, or, or what, is it a more general observation? It's a general observation. So, so it's not a one yeah, so in, in a, it's a journal observation, it's more concepts than, than math because I'm using a different model. Right. And, and, and was there space on data or, so, or their models? Was their models is pure Lotka Volter uh, models. Right. Yeah, just model that they deal with the parameters differently. Right. Mm -hmm. Oh, those are great questions, all of them. Uh, first of all, I was just studying one of the systems, so that question would be great for a meta-analysis. Uh, that uh, once I tried to do and I just didn't continue doing it. So uh, I don't know. That's my answer. I don't know. Uh, I have invaded theoretical systems with uh, more uh, nest if you can call more nested or m more contributors to nested and less contributors to nested nest uh, and uh, I'm just doing those simulations so I, I don't know that either but I think that is a, a pretty good thing to test and for the first question that is like where are those I would just do an, a meta-analysis uh, there are a lot of meta-analysis on alien plants in, in some of them in pollination networks so ju it's just like random analysis again and look w where in the, in the scale of contribution to nest and nest those plants are. And uh, regarding my research, I did not track the pollinators, the alien pollinators. So it's something also good to check. But it's easier to know wh who are the, which are the alien plants than the insects. Yeah. So it's a good question, forward question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so first of all, it's not a permanent spe specialization. So these are, the links are still there. The, the, the potential of the pollinators to keep on visiting all those plants still is there. So g I have conducted some uh, removals or changes in extinctions on the plants and the pollinators respond to that. So uh, they, for example, if I remove the specialist plant, they don't keep on looking for that plant, they go to somewhere else. So among the their links that they have available. So uh, my answer to your question would be like, then the structure of the network persists as the potential interactions. Now, how much of those interactions are realized is something that is context de dependent. That answer your question? Because of the perturbances. Be mm -hmm. Yeah, good.
really doing. Right. So I'll have dinner with you. Yay, great. Oh, yeah, yeah, great. Oh, thank you very much. Great. <laughs> oh, great. Really yeah, yeah. So I had one question for you. So if you, you, when you, when you showed the rumble data against the theoretical predictions, I noticed that there was a nice uh, agreement on the slopes, but the, the scales were shifted by a bit. Is, yeah. that, uh, is that just a, uh, a tuning parameter, or is that a, do you think there's some meaning to that? Uh, is, there is meaning there. Is because. Hey, I remember. Hi, I'm <laughs> yeah, me Sorry, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, there is meaning there, and, and it's, it's pretty fundamental. Is that the the size of the networks are different, so the x-axis is different because the number of interactions that each plant has is different among networks. So, but do you expect that changing the size of the network would really change the theoretical conclusions? Probably not, no? No, no, yeah. that's why I, I'm still confident to put them together, but they are not, the scale does not have many, it's like, it's a qualitative comparison, not a quantitative yeah, comparison. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. That's a good, that's a good answer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just going to say, I, you're, you're making me like network theory. <laughs> <laughs> you're right here. <laughs> Starting to put the things that matter. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was a matter so, of time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you know, it takes people to start actually. Start getting it. Uh, oh yeah, the quantitative strength of the wings matters. The behavior matters. The behavior matters. Right. The fact that you have different types of interactions going on simultaneously matters. I'm a mechanistic person. John hates mechanistic. I love mechanistic. Thanks, anyway. Thank you. So, I want to ask. We should take the microphone. Ah, sure. Thanks for that. Well, it's, it's, yeah, you're, it's, yeah, yeah. for example, in, in, what happens, for example, in, in very in islands, yeah, in research, uh, research in islands, that they do some of this, what you're asking. So very, very old island, they found that, that there is not much, like, adaptation going on. They're, like, fixed there, for example, they, if, if a species was a very... Yeah. Very plastic species yeah, somewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, if that was able to, to change its diet each time. Yeah. In a very old island, usually it becomes just a special fish there, or it, has, like, it loses its ability because maybe they say that it's because they lose the because it's costly to have this adaptive behavior, so they, they just hang out there because they're not perturbed. So that so that fits with. Aaron's question, yeah. I can see that if you have a complex, persistent system, mm -hmm. but then you have these environmental fluctuations or yeah. disturbances, that big, sense. big storms. And we have humans now, changes. but they're, they're not isolated the island anymore. <laughs> so so what do you see? If, if you looked at adaptive foraging, mm -hmm. the level of adaptive foraging in one of the systems, it would be high, and then there would be some rearrangement of the system with a strong perturbation. So things would go back to being ju just generals. Oh, well, let's just try a little bit of everything just to make do it, until we can get back to the stable system and have high adaptive. Is that what you would expect to see? Maybe. That is something to, to test. I, I wouldn't like just right away say, say yes. I would, I would like better to test it, like to have yeah, and that would be like something to incorporate with genes, like more uh, real adaptation. What I have here is more of a behavioral response. So it's like more plasticity than, than genes that are transferred over there. But it's kind of interesting, right? Because your use of the replicator equations yes. there, it's almost, it's not like really pure plasticity. It's almost like, it's like you have a community of ideas yes. of different possible behaviors, and those are replicating and being passed around freely. 
from amongst through the organisms, right? Yes. So that repertoire of ideas they, they spread if they're more pop, you know, become more popular if they're more if they're. Yes, I, I've been trying to say explain that to biologists, but they don't. So I prefer to just play safe and say that. It makes good sense for humans in any way. I don't know, maybe. <laughs> But I, like when any time that but isn't I have, that the explanation for developing higher levels of adaptive foraging in complex stable systems? Mm -hmm. Right, it's, it's, because that's just what you—that's what you expect. You you have all of these possibilities, and they're sorting things out. Right, if you only have one one, one predator and two prey. Well, guess what? You, you know, the predator is probably going to take some of both, especially if there's any seasonal yeah. change in the reproduction of the prey and, and, and so yeah. forth. But, but the more complex you get, the they get more, more specialized. M I they saw get like more specialized. My, my, like, the, like, where in, like, if I had like a, the larger web starting around, like the, the, the width, like the length, for the, the weight of the link gets really like 0.9. And the rest is like almost zero. Yeah. It's like, yeah, exactly what you said. It's not, because that's, that's intuitive to you. Yeah. Exactly what you said. Uh huh. Yeah. More choices, you get more, you get pickier. Okay. So the only cost of all of this adaptability is the opportunity cost, yeah. right? Just that you may. Exactly. You may, you do some things that are suboptimal some of the time. Yes. Yes. We know that's there. But, we but, know that the but, but again, in a stable, complex system, you're going to figure that out. If you're... Right? I mean, well, if, if, if that's what you're... Think about going to lecture rooms. You know you have to lecture somewhere on campus. Right? And, and so, well, so you do the opportunity... So, <laughs> so you just random walk around. But you randomly walk around and you start the lecture well, room. Well, somewhere over that day. direction, <laughs> there's a class waiting for me. So you keep narrowing it down every time you make a choice. And then by the right? end of the term, you found by the class. end, you walk right to, to <laughs> the class every single time. Right? So that's the opportunity. You have all those opportunities, but you're constantly winnowing the ones yeah. that aren't paying off. I guess so. I guess so. There are probably constraints to how focused you can be. I don't know. It's very interesting. Yeah. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, it was nice meeting you. I, it was an interesting talk. Uh, great. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, very interesting. I was just going to ask about how how this generalizes to predator prey instead of yeah. you know, pollinators. Yeah, it's actually it's, it's very straightforward. Actually, I took this from footwork. So it's, it's the same idea. You have all the prey there, and the, pollin the the predator now the predator it goes where the where goes to the prey that is more available which means more abundant or more available in the landscape, depending which is the, the, the specific way that we are applying it. But it's the same idea, so where it gets the most benefit. If you are modeling like quality of resources, like if some, it's all about profit in, in, in food web. So the, the predator goes to, goes to catch or forage more on the prey that uh, gets more profit in benefits. So depending how you model those profit, usually it's abundance only. So it goes more uh, to the more abundant prey. Yeah. So um, I, I study uh, aquatic systems, and most aquatic systems, um, well, uh, and fish, I study fish. Okay. So uh, the, the growth rates of fish are very, very dynamic. I mean, mm. they're they're, it's not, you know, you're one year at this size, and you're one year at this size, and one year at this size. Growth, it's also it's dependent in, yeah, on food availability, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, every, yeah. So if food becomes available, you can grow really fast, maybe mature earlier, it's slow, you, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so any kind of adaptive foraging and any kind of variability in the environment 